Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon for some of you. Uh, welcome to our fourth edition of our webinar series, uh, Copper the Benefit of Grower Finisher Pick Production. Uh, Alice Hibbert is going to be your presenter for today. Um, my name is Chantal van Lin. I'm going to be your host. Uh, and before I give the floor to Alice with a very interesting story, I uh, want to go through uh, some of the, the things uh, related to this uh, webinar. Um, please raise your questions. Uh, there are no silly questions, all questions we are going to try to answer, but please do so uh, via your questions pane in your GoToWebinar tool. Uh, you can type them in there, we will see them pop in. Um, if necessary, we will address them right away, but most of them uh, we will try to keep for the Q&A session after that is it, the presentation. Uh, but feel free to ask any of the questions that you, uh, that you have. And this webinar uh, will be recorded and the recordings will be available upon request after the webinar. Uh, the same goes for, uh, for handouts. Um, if you have uh, problems with your audio or whatsoever, also use the question uh, uh, section uh, and I can uh, try to help you solve it. Um, just a small disclaimer before we get started. Um, please note that the product names and claims that mentioned in this webinar are quite generic and they can differ from a local situation and a local uh, registration and legislation. So please contact your local CELCO or TRAU representative uh, to discuss uh, your needs and options. Um, having said this, with no further ado, I'm going to give the floor to uh, Alice uh, and uh, um, a very nice webinar and talk to you later. Thanks, Chantelle. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining. Um, so, uh, as Chantelle said, I'm Alice Hibbert. Uh, I'm in our global program management team here at Trow Nutrition. Uh, and I'm here today just to talk to you about uh, some key topics in uh, swine nutrition and the effect of copper uh, within those. So, uh, we have a full agenda today. Um, so we, I've, I've left some space and time in the agenda for a question. So as Chantal said, I would like to reiterate, uh, we're very, very happy to receive any of your questions. Uh, please feel free to ask, um, either in the chat function or uh, with me later. So um, first of all, I'm going to talk a bit about the role in, of copper in swine nutrition. Um, then understanding, okay, with supplementing trace minerals uh, and, and not all sources are created equal. Uh, then understanding why there is a extra nutritional effect and uh, trying to define some of the uh, current theories. And then looking at some of the validation work and uh, application information uh, from us, from Trial Nutrition, uh, and the results that we see in practice with high levels of copper. Uh, so first of all, the role of copper in swine nutrition. So uh, generally, when we're looking at uh, trace mineral nutrition, uh, we need to remember that our ultimate goal is to have the optimum balance of trace minerals. So we want to keep the animals in a state of positive homeostasis. Um, so the animal is neither uh, sufficient um, or at toxic levels, there is a homeostasis of, of concentration of trace minerals across the wall of the GI tract. Um, and in this period, the animal will have uh, optimal performance. So what happens when we uh, reduce our balance or we start to get suboptimal supply or suboptimal trace mineral balance? Well, the less vital functions are sacrificed first. So um, the, the functions which the trace mineral plays, uh, which are not vital to the animal's survival or reproduction, such as hair loss um, or tissue integrity, may be compromised first. Um, but then uh, it's, not, it's not until we get to a severe, severe uh, disbalance in trace mineral supply that we start to see a failure of physiological functions and inhibition to reproduction. So, with trace mineral, mineral nutrition, we're always trying to have a good balance and keep our animals in this uh, period. So uh, just some key important uh, practical uh, uh, functions of different trace minerals. 
So fertility is a key one, stress resistance. So many trace minerals um, will uh, catalyze enzymatic reactions, which allow other things, other functions to happen in the body. And we'll go through some of these in a minute. Uh, but really the, the key nutritionally significant trace minerals that we think about are zinc, manganese, copper, and selenium. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about copper. Uh, copper, you can see, plays a role in all of these functions, uh, these key functions, um, not only with the animal's health and uh, uh, reproductive capacity, but also um, in its ability to uh, carry out its metabolic reactions. So um, I've just listed out some key functions and gone and going into a bit more depth. So several uh, uh, enzymes in the body are copper dependent and they play a very important role in antioxidant defense, the animal's antioxidant defense. Uh, so for example, those enzymes are superoxide dismutase and cytochrome C. Um, so essentially, uh, when we are helping the animal to uh, fortify its antioxidant defense, we are helping the animal to support its own uh, health status and reduce inflammation. So this is a very key and important function we need to remember uh, when we are making sure copper is being supplemented at the right level. Uh, so copper also works within macrophages to combat certain infectious agents as well. So helping to um, maximize the uh, immune response. So the animal's response to some sort of disease challenge. Uh, so again, copper has, has an important role within immunity. So the more functional um, uh, uh, functions of copper, uh, it plays a role in the formation of collagen and elastin. Uh, uh, also normal hair and skin pigmentation. Uh, copper plays a role in melanin formation um, in the form of uh, copper tyrosine. Um, the functioning of the nervous system is also uh, heavily affected by copper because copper is the uh, is a key uh, uh, facilitator of the reaction that produces myelin, which is the myelin sheath which which covers all of the nerves within the animal's body. Uh, so uh, copper deficiencies, especially or disbalances, can uh, cause issues with nervous system and extreme cases. Uh, also, uh, it's important plays an important role in iron metabolism, which then um, which then has an effect on uh, the oxygen transportation around the animal's body. So um, I just noted in a bit more detail here the, uh, the notable metabolic forms and the functions, which I've gone into a bit more detail at the top. But as we can see, the animal uh, uh, requires copper uh, at varying different levels uh, throughout its uh, production cycle in order to optimize uh, performance and health and welfare. Okay, so um, trace minerals. Okay, so first of all, we've talked about, we know copper is important. Now uh, we move more into the practical application and understand a bit more about trace mineral supplementation. So uh, the key message for this section is really that understanding there's different sources out there and not all are created equal. So um, just to run you through uh, the history of what, why uh, and what sources are, are out there. So in the 1900s, when agriculture became more intensive, uh, modern genetics started to occur. So in, in especially in, in poultry and swine, um, we saw serious genetic uh, uh, development. And because the monogastric animal requires all of its trace minerals from feed, um, you know, it's not um, making its own energy and, and uh, from, from forages, for example, like ruminants, uh, it's very, very important to actually support those animals um, with the higher levels of trace mineral that the new genetic lines were requiring. So uh, the agriculture industry solved this problem by finding uh, co-products from different industrial processes, which were suitable to feed to animals. These things are oxides, and sulfates. So uh, for many years, these have been fed and still are fed in lots of cases, um, with a not a, a not a lot of research and development into the effect these trace minerals are having. 
uh, on the rest of the feed uh, and also uh, on animal production. So there started to be a bit more research in this area um, and it was understood and recognized that oxides and sulfates were having a negative impact on feed stability um, and a number of other different factors, uh, so such as bioavailability. So um, it was recognized that not necessarily all of the trace minerals that were being supplemented were, were available for the animal when they got into the small intestine. So at that point, we saw, OK, there's uh, a new innovations. Um, we looked at and invented the organic trace mineral, so proteinates and amino acid chelates, for example. So um, we found this was a, a good solution, and it uh, still is a very good solution. Uh, however, it was recognized that because of the cost of these organic trace minerals, in general, in practice, the, the inorganic uh, hydrox the inorganic oxides and sulfates were only partially replaced with the organic trace minerals. What then Alice, happened? Alice, yes. sorry to disturb. To, I get a question that some of the bottom part of your presentation is disappearing. So I'm just going to put okay. your camera out to see if that uh, that makes a difference. Okay. Okay, can I continue, Shantam? Yeah, you can. Okay. Good. No, it doesn't make a difference. Can you see if you can go to your uh, panel and uh, and change your um, settings of your slides? Uh, okay. So how do I do that? Which which share, sharing? Okay. And then show screen. And which option did you choose there? Uh, main monitor clean. Hide icons background yeah, normally it's because i see it now as well um you see the just keep, part keep, of my yeah just a, it's just a, just a, just a small part so if you uh, keep that in mind for your presentation um the handouts will be available uh, uh so uh, uh on request we can uh, send them to you and i think the most part is uh you can see because for some reason uh if you have that setting then it should be fine normally so just, okay. just proceed, but keep that in mind that sometimes when you have really something on the bottom that you uh, have to talk through it instead of that we can see it. Okay. Okay. But you can, but you can see the bottom. You can see the no. bottom of my presentation. No, I, I have the same problem now for some oh, reason. Do you? Just, yeah, oh. but it, but but it is just a really small part. So I think most okay. of the time it's, uh, it's going to be fine. But uh, we okay. will share the handouts uh, when people want to. So uh, let's do that. So apologies for this. Uh, um this small uh this small mistake in uh in the slide so but please continue sorry for disturbing okay that's fine sorry everybody yes i will make sure i read any important words at the bottom of the slides and, and you'll receive handouts okay so um at that point uh then the hydroxy trace mineral was invented which is the sort of newest innovation in trace minerals um which which helped to optimize bioavailability and cost in order to provide a solution where you could 100% replace the oxides and sulfates um, and even the, uh, in some cases, the organic trace minerals. Okay. So um, the, the mineral definitions, uh, it's an important to remember and think about. Um, so we can see that uh, the, oxidi the oxides uh, are oxidized metals. They have a pretty low solubility. And my colleague Davi actually did a presentation on this topic a few weeks back. Uh, and variable solubility is, I think, a, a key word as well as low. Um, low relative bioavailability, but also low cost. Um, inorganic salts like uh, carbonates and sulfates and chlorides, uh, they also, uh, they, they're quite soluble. Um, uh, they have a, a medium relative bioavailability. They also have a low cost. So the key with these two at the top are they are uh, variable and uh, quite commoditized. So it's hard to guarantee the quality of these. Um, organic chelates, uh, we can see uh, with regards to solubility, is mixed from, from source to source, um, but have a higher relative bioavailability, uh, but also the highest cost. Uh, but then the hydroxy, as we say, um, is the interbond minerals. Uh, it has a, a lower solubility, uh, higher relative bioavailability, and medium cost. 
So the hydroxytrace mineral um, is uh, the solution in order to replace the inorganic trace minerals, um, still at a, um, a realistic uh, price point and uh, with high bioavailability. Okay, so um, something that is a very important uh, when we're thinking about our trace mineral source is uh, I was talking about solubility just then. Well, this solubility, I suppose, is good when it, the trace mineral is soluble in the small intestine, for example. Uh, but what happens when the trace mineral is soluble before you want it to become available for the animal? Well, what we know is that uh, some trace minerals have an extremely negative impact on vitamin stability. Uh, so I just highlighted some graphs here to show you the differences between different sources in uh, vitamin stability. Uh, so you can see the, the chelated trace mineral, which is uh, quite insoluble in the feed itself. Um, you can see the vitamin retention. Uh, you can see the oxide. Uh, has, a, has a lower vitamin stability or causes lower vitamin stability. Uh, the sulfate has even lower, so this would be the standard inorganic form. And free metal is even lower. So essentially, um, what we can see is that by having inorganic uh, salt form of trace minerals uh, or even oxides, uh, over time you get a larger amount of degradation of vitamins, so reduced vitamin retention. Uh, so this is a very important factor um, and can uh, have a big impact on animal performance uh, and feed quality. Um, so it should be considered when thinking about what trace mineral sources used. So when we looked at this with hydroxy trace minerals, uh, we, we actually analysed vitamin E in feed, we had a control with no supplementation, we had high levels of copper from sulphate or Intellibon C. So it's important to mention that when you are supplementing high levels, you are um, in fact going to have more of a negative impact in these cases. So the uh, copper sulphate you can see you significant reduction over time in your vitamin E in feed, 24% reduction, uh, and after 41 days, 69% reduction. Uh, in Tenebon C, in fact, you see a very similar uh, effect as the control, which is no supplementation, which indicates that the Intellibond is in fact not interacting at all with the vitamins in the feed. Uh, so uh, essentially, the product is remaining insoluble uh, until it gets into the animal's GI tract. So 36% more after 10 days and three times more uh, vitamin E left after 41 days. Uh, this is obviously very important for swine because historically swine diets have been uh, supplemented pretty high vitamin E levels. So important to think about. Uh, also, this effect is, is seen in the plasma as well. So not only do we see it when we analyze the feed, but we also see it with the uh, status of the animal. Uh, we see a significantly higher level of uh, vitamin E present in the animal's plasma uh, from Intellibon copper than copper sulfate. So uh, based on you know, two treatments, the animals consume these two diets. Okay. Uh, one other comment, it's about also uh, uh, feed uh, quality, uh, premix quality. So uh, we often see with these inorganic trace minerals, because they're very reactive, we see large amounts of clumping and issues with uh, physical quality, especially in hot, humid environments. So we see, uh, for example, in a, in, a, in a trial we did here, looking at a combined organic, uh, inorganic, uh, Intellibond organic and inorganic, and then pure Intellibond, uh, we see uh, very different physical properties with the uh, with the quality and the level of clumping that we see in premixes um, 
that to the pure and telebond treatment. Uh, one other factor as well uh, is phytase um, efficacy. So we all spend a lot of money in supplementing our diets with phytase. Um, but how effective is that phytase and uh, what effect is our, our, our uh, very soluble, very reactive trace mineral sources having on this phytase activity? So we wanted to find this out um, and we uh, uh, looked at different sources of copper and we measured the relative phosphorus release measured, measured by the, the phosphorus hydrolysis reaction. Um, and we used increasing levels of copper. So we can see the dotted treatment here is zero. Um, this one is 62.5 ppms of copper. And we have 125, 250, and 500. So the levels are increasing um, as we go up these, these bars. So the first thing we can see is the, the copper citrate, copper chloride, and copper sulfate. Um, the minute you add any uh, trace mineral, from copper from these sources, you get a significant reduction in phosphorus release and, a, and hence a significant reduction in, um, in phytase hydrolysis. So essentially, uh, because the trace minerals have a high affinity for uh, binding with the phytate, uh, the, this is blocking the effect of the phytase enzymes that we want to release the phosphorus. So we see a significant reduction in phosphorus release as the level of copper goes up. So with your high levels of copper, um, potentially, uh, if you're feeding, normally the feeding rates would be around 125 to 250, and the 500 treatment was put in to push the boundaries. If you utilize an inorganic source of trace minerals, this may be rendering your uh, phytate largely un, uh, uneff ineffective. Uh, so. So then um, what we looked at was the organic trace mineral, which is copper lysine, and the hydroxy trace mineral, which is iron telebond C. And we see, in fact, um, that the effect is a lot less uh, a lot less significant, especially with the hydroxy trace mineral. So this is because our hydroxy trace mineral is not uh, soluble in feed. So um, it's important to consider the level of solubility in feed uh, uh, when you're looking at your, your trace mineral source choice. So we can see there's a significantly larger amount of uh, phos relative phosphorus release uh, with intellibond copper um, at high levels, uh, meaning that it's an important thing to think about. Uh, so essentially what we're saying is copper inhibits the efficacy of phytase and higher concentration cause more inhibition, um, improved sources of copper prevent this due to their low release of free metal ions. Okay, so um, we have talked about nutritional levels, we've talked about the effect of supplementation in the feed. Now uh, we need to think about at what, what's happening when we supplement high levels of trace minerals. So, the NRC requirement for swine uh, for copper is pretty low, uh, five, six, I think it is from memory. Um, but in practice, what we look at is feeding between 125 uh, and 225 ppms of copper, um, which we often see in practice has a positive impact on growth. Now, um, it's important to uh, remember that these two are two different modes of action. And this is what we will go through in, in, through these next slides. So, as I said, uh, we can split this into two applications. One is nutritional levels. So I'll just uh, read the definition from the slide here. So it's measured by the amount of ionic metal delivered across the intestinal wall. Uh, the trace mineral, this is represented by the trace mineral level which fulfills the animal's systemic need and physiological demand for trace minerals. Um, so we then get, uh, uh, we, we can see that as I went through in the slides previously, these uh, trace minerals delivered across the bloodstream, into the bloodstream, um, will help with tissue integrity, enzyme processes, immune competency, uh, and performance and animal well-being to some extent. Um, 
But what we find is in practice, the higher levels, so uh, when the trace mineral significantly exceeds the nutritional feeding level, uh, we can create a high concentration of copper in the intestinal tract, uh, often 125 to 250 ppms, and this can have an extra nutritional effect. So there's a couple of reasons why this may be happening, um, but generally what we see in practice is gut integrity and health, feed efficiency, and also growth rate. So there's a few modes of action proposed and I have some uh, data and, and references for this. So I will send this, uh, the, the papers around that I refer to with regards to the points here after this presentation. Uh, but essentially we see that copper has a, a bacteriostatic or bactericidal property. So by increasing the concentration of copper to a high enough level in the gut, it can suppress the growth of certain uh, uh, bacteria. So when I did some literature research, um, we saw that the presence of copper um, helps to reduce clostridium, salmonella, um, and uh, total anaerobic bacteria, as well as coliform uh, populations as well in the small intestine and the colon of pigs. So um, essentially, we're seeing this effect and this antimicrobial effect, um, and we think what's happening is it's having a positive impact on the growth of the animals. Uh, also, a secondary area which is uh, which we um, and I know others are researching into uh, is the effect um, on nutrients or nutrient sparing, nutrient uh, digestibility. So, because of this change in um, bacterial content of the gut, which is largely driven by these uh, bacteri bactericidal properties, we're understanding now that this may have an impact on uh, nutrient availability for the animals. Because these microbes invariably are breaking down and consuming the, the nutrients available in the feed, as I say, such as the amino acids or fat. So first of all, we'll dive into uh, the, the antimicrobial effect of copper, uh, at what levels we see uh, uh, this happening. So. First of all, uh, copper in the media, in popular culture as well, uh, is well established as an antimicrobial. Uh, so we see in hospitals, copper is being used as a material for door handles and different, um, different things. Uh, we see that looking at effectiveness against different superbugs, such as MS MRSA. So uh, we know that copper um, is limiting the microbial growth. And it's up to us in this industry to take that effect, uh, harness it, and, and apply it in the correct way. So we did some work looking at uh, different, uh, so in a lab, uh, at different colonies of different bacteria. So Salmonella enteridinis, uh, uh, E. coli, Clostridium perfringens, and Salmonella gallinarium. Um, we plated these up. Um, and we counted the colonies that were present uh, in the Petri dish. So within the Petri dish uh, substrate, we supplemented different concentrations of copper. Um, so we looked at 100 ppms, 150 ppms, 200, 400, and 600. Um, and the effect was quite interesting. So what we saw was as the levels increase, um, we saw a reduced amount of colonies counted. This is TMC, too many colonies counted to count. We also saw a differential effect between the different bacteria. So for example, um, uh, Salmonella is a lot harder to kill than some of the other bacteria like, um, like E. coli, for example. And this varies based on the serotype as well. But uh, what I hear you all thinking, these levels are so high and we would never feed these to our animals. Well, this was considered in the trial design. So yes, completely inhibited at 600 ppms. What we need to remember is that when the, um, when the animal consumes feed, uh, it will absorb a lot of the um, uh, starch and proteins, for example, um, first. So this means that the, uh, the copper remaining that has not been absorbed in the small intestine 
um, becomes more and more concentrated down the digestive tract. So we need to remember when we look at the digestive tract, the animal is absorbing most of its nutrients around here. So uh, the copper that will be absorbed, the animal can absorb the, the five to six to 10. Um, in practice, we add around 25 ppms of copper in general to swine diets. Um, uh, so that sort of represents a nutritional requirement. But everything over and above that will remain in the animal's gut um, and will concentrate, especially towards the end of the gut. And generally, we think about the concentration in the hind gut. So, um, it's because of this concentration effect, we see, based on this graph, uh, that feeding 150 ppm's um, equals around 375 ppm's in the lower GI tract. Each one ppm in the diet is around two and a half ppm's in the lower GI tract. Uh, and 600 ppm's in the lower GI tract uh, is around 240 ppm's in feed. Uh, so when we go back to our original graph and we look at it slightly differently, uh, when we look at the equivalence uh, within the gut, we can see that 100 ppm's is around uh, 10 ppm supplemented in feed equivalence. Uh, 200 ppm's in the Petri dish is around 125 ppm supplemented in feed equivalency. Uh, uh, the the uh, 150 uh, supplemented in feed is around 400. And 250 supplemented in feed is around 600 ppm's uh, actual concentration. So when we take into account these numbers, which give rise to these concentrations, uh, we see that these numbers are actually a bit more realistic. So we utilize this information to understand uh, what levels give the best antimicrobial effects um, and what should we, uh, how should we apply this in animals. So the conclusion we came to was is that between 100, 125 and 250 ppms, depending on the level of challenge, um, which will get us a significant inhibition of some of these pathogenic bacteria. So the second mode of action I discussed was on uh, nutrient digestibility um, and nutrient sparing. Uh, and we've done some work looking at uh, microbial protein as well as uh, lipid digestibility. So we've done a couple of trials on this as a, bit, as a company. Um, first of all, uh, we're looking at the, this first trial here. Uh, and our objective was to understand if supplementing in growing pigs with 150 ppms of copper if this will improve nutrient digestibility after the con and alter the concentration of microbial protein. Uh, so we, uh, we, with regards to the design, we looked at, um, we, we looked at a cannula installation in the distal ileum. Um, so it's two times two factorial treatment design. Um, and essentially uh, the treatments themselves, we use two levels of distillers dries grains to manipulate the level of protein, um, and also two different supplemental levels of, of copper from Intellibond copper. Uh, we collected the feces and the ileal digester, uh, and the findings are as follows. So our conclusion from this trial is that Intellibond C can reduce the microbial population uh, present in the lower GI tract, um, and the negative impact of these microbes on fat and VFA production uh, digestibility uh, in growing pigs. So we can see here that um, when looking at these trials in detail, we see the fecal uh, microbial protein on a dry matter basis measured here. Uh, we can see that no DDG uh, treatment here and the high DDG treatment here. Um, and we see a significant uh, reduction in fecal microbial protein, which is showing that the copper is reducing the amount of bacteria uh, or microbes uh, in the hind gut, especially. Uh, also, um, we see that the um, uh, with the uh, uh, essentially we see that the apparent ileal digestibility um, and the apparent tract uh, total tract digestibility of acid 
hydrolyzed ether extract is greater in growing pigs supplemented with Soco and Telebon C as the copper source. Uh, so we can see that there is also a effect on digestibility of um, uh, of um, fats as well. Okay. Second, uh, lipid metabolism. So we looked at, um, we supplemented 150 ppms again from Intellibond. Um, uh, we looked also in this case at um, a number of different uh, genes involved in lipid metabolism of pigs. Uh, so again, we, we utilized um, some different raw materials to manipulate the uh, fat levels and protein levels of the diet. Um, so we included uh, uh, one pig per treatment and we sampled uh, the liver, skeletal muscles and adipose tissue um, to analyze these different genes. So the result was that copper does have an impact, so like our first trial on lipid metabolism. Um, so essentially, um, we saw this both in the uh, analytical data. So looking at the uh, expression in the liver, the skeletal muscles and the subcutaneous adipose tissue, um, we can see that um, when we supplement 150 ppms of copper, it can upregulate the abundance of genes involved in post-absorptive metabolism of lipids. Um, and also with regards to performance, gross performance, we see significant improvement. Uh, so this is backed up by performance practically as well. Yeah. Okay, so then I'm gonna go on to just talking about the uh, application and result, practical results. Um, of high level copper. So, um, first of all, um, I want to show you just some data looking at uh, uh, lift different levels um, and different uh, periods over the uh, cycle. So, essentially, um, this trial uh, we did uh, in the US in 2013, a number of different treatments. Uh, we had a, a control. Uh, uh, and a negative control. Uh, then we had differing levels of copper from copper sulfate and also intellibond copper. So here we are directly comparing the uh, intellibond from the uh, copper sulfate uh, treatments. So the body weight change uh, we can see. So the difference in body weight, and apologies, this is in pounds. Um, but the body weight change versus negative control. Um, negative control, we mean the uh, sulfate treatment. So intellibond versus sulfate throughout the phases of the animal's uh, finishing period. Uh, when we feed 75 ppms of copper, uh, we see the difference between the treatments peaks at around 200 pounds um, before the end of the uh, cycle. But what we wanted to find out is, okay, will this level of a linear improvement uh, with Intellibond uh, increase further if we increase the levels? And what we found was that it did. So essentially, uh, what's happening is, as we go through the growing uh, finishing cycle, um, this effect on growth is increasing further and further as the pigs get larger. Now. Most of us know, I think, that um, lipid deposition increases further and further uh, through the uh, uh, growing finishing cycle with regards to the animal's metabolism of different nutrients. Um, and so this makes sense with the results we previously saw with regards to lipid uh, metabolism um, and gene regulation. We can see actually that these growth effects are increasing more and more through the growth cycle. Most importantly, we also see the improvements with sulfate are not uh, the same and, and peak around uh, phase three of feeding, largely. Uh, so we see the source of trace mineral is important, obviously, for feed quality, but also for animal performance and the way that these trace minerals are being absorbed and or are being utilized by um, 
uh, the animal to um, have that antimicrobial effect. Also, we see a result uh, in uh, carcass quality. So we see an extra 2.1 kilos, this time we're in kilos, um, between the inorganic, uh, uh, sorry, between the, yeah, between the sulfate and the intellibon treatments. So not only do we see improved growth, but we also see improved carcass, hot carcass weight, which, which gives us a return on investment. And this has just broken down the whole trial. So uh, basically, we're seeing significant body weight gain with copper addition later in the finishing period, uh, not necessarily early, as some studies suggest. Uh, so uh, with piglets, obviously, we see a significant improvement. But uh, generally, the exciting stuff and the growth is happening later in the cycle. OK, so. Um, just one more piece of work I want to go through, um, and then we can go to some questions. Uh, this is a, a, a combination of trials um, that were all conducted at Kansas State University in the US, uh, and we did a, a multi-trial analysis in order to assess uh, this effect across many different, um, many different situations. So, the objective of this um, was to evaluate the effects of high levels of added copper on growing finishing pigs, and the performance of growth and the carcass characteristics. Um, so we used eight trials um, and through this we had a large amount of pigs, um, 6,790 pigs and 331 observations. The trials were carried out between 2013 and 18. Uh, and the intellibond copper levels ranged between 75 and 200 ppms. So um, most of them were at 150. Uh, the control diets were used uh, with low copper. Um, so if someone can't see it at the bottom, uh, the pigs were fed treatment diets throughout the entire grow finish period. Um, and then also the statistical analysis was completed to get um, to understand the significance of the results. So the results from the individual studies, uh, we can see that these are all the different studies, the, the initial body weight, the final body weight, and the level. Um, so overall, we saw that diet, season, gender were also included in the analysis. And none of the studies were performed uh, during the summer. Uh, and we saw overall uh, some nice improvements, but obviously, as we always know, a variable uh, results across the trials. Uh, so when looking at this with performance by phase, um, we see uh, we've looked at average daily gain, feed intake, and feed to gain, which is FCR but backwards. If you guys don't know, um, and we saw some nice significant results um, within the grower uh, period on average daily gain and um, average daily feed intake. But then we saw a bit the um, also significant uh, results. Um, in the finisher performance as well. So we see that actually the feed intake may be, may be tailing off um, and the average daily gain improvements, as we saw in the previous trial, continue. Uh, so results by body weight. So this is the uh, 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 body weight. Uh, we saw significant improvements uh, in the grower and the final as well, so the grower and the finisher final body weights. Um, and we see, coming out of the grower phase, uh, we see um, 1.08 kilos or 2.4 pounds improvement, which is highly significant. And with the uh, final body weight, we see 3.8 pounds and 1.72 kilos improvement, uh, again, which is uh, statistically significant. Okay, so overall performance, um, all the phases together, uh, we again see statistically significant improvements in average daily gain and feed intake as well, um, as well as the hot carcass weight improvements, an overall 2.9 pounds improvement. So overall, looking at the carcass characteristics, uh, as I said, we see 2.9 
uh, pounds improvement. Um, and then the carcass ADG as well. So looking at kilo of feed, uh, sorry, yeah, so, so looking at the average daily gain in pounds of uh, the carcass, we see a significant improvement there. So, um, with grower finisher pigs, um, we know that they, they eat a lot, um, and we know that feeding higher levels of a improved trace mineral source is often perceived as very expensive. Uh, but my question to you is, what is the value of that? So, that's what we did. We looked at the economic implications of these uh, uh, adding these high levels of, of trace mineral. Um, so, essentially, I'll take you through this. Uh, so prior to the addition of high levels of Intellibon copper, growing finishing pigs in this fixed time scenario of 100 days, having an average daily feed intake of, of uh, 5.91 pounds or 2.68 kilos per day. So basically in this economical situation, we looked at 100 days standardized and we included the differences in feed intake. Um, the supplementation of 150 ppms of copper from Intellibond copper increases the diet cost by $1.32 per ton. Um, sorry, no, for the time period. Um, and the average daily feed intake increases, uh, taking into account the increased average daily feed intake uh, per day, resulting in the 2.9 pounds improvement in hot carcass weight. Um, Supplementation of Intellibond copper increases the pig revenue uh, by $1.89 if the hot carcass weight is valued at this. And again, as we're different in different markets, but this was taken because it was in the US. Um, so essentially, the improvement um, over the feed cost, which is the important part, is uh, 56 cents per pig. So we see um, a, a large improvement in profitability per pig. Uh, and if you're running a large uh, swine operation, this will certainly add up. So, the conclusion of these trials, um, Intellibond copper improves performance of pigs, both in the grow and finisher phases. Um, the hot carcass weight has improved by 2.9 pounds, um, which gives us a big return on investment. Um, and also improvements in gross performance and hot carcass weight were demonstrated, regardless of the seasonality as well. So um, that's all from me. Um, thank you very much for listening to my presentation. Uh, I hope we've got lots of nice questions to uh, uh, fill the last 10 minutes. Uh, and I'll hand over to uh, Chantelle quickly uh, for the final slide. Yeah, well, I'm just going to do this one uh, as, a, as a closing. So we, uh, we're going for to uh, the questions. So uh, again, okay. feel free to uh, pop your questions in uh, in the panel when you have them. So uh, we have uh, we have enough to go through, but uh, uh, we can always have more. And we will, if we not have time, uh, don't have enough time, we will answer them uh, via email afterwards. So I'm just going to start uh, with the first one. Um, and that's from Denise, and she's asking, uh, is it published to study uh, evaluating vitamin stability? And can you provide the source? Yes, yes I can. Um, I can. I put it in the slide. There's uh, some work we did with Luo et al. Um, and I will provide the source for definite. Um, I mean, my my background actually in trial nutrition has been in um, in, in premixes. <laughs> so it's actually an area from my previous uh, world that I knew a lot about. I used to uh, always be looking for source materials. Uh, so yes, we've done we've done some work uh, looking into this both with Intellibond. Also, there's a, a, some nice published sources out there. So um, I will send you over. We will arrange to send over the, the the papers we've referred to in the presentation. Perfect. And she asked if, if the differences were significant. Uh, I believe so. Yes, I believe so. Yes. Great. Then we have a question of Aria, hoping that I pronounce your name right. Um, I am wondering uh, which marker was used in the ileal digestibility assessment, uh, if it was a trace mineral marker such as titanium or cobalt, are you not worried about the interaction between the marker and the copper or the effect of the marker on the microbiota? 
Yeah. Um, so um, I would need to check that. I think it was titanium. Um, we don't. We haven't seen any effect uh, of that on the on the uh, copper or the uh, or the microbes. So what I can do is send you the, the full paper and take a look through. Uh, because it was all uh, looked into and considered in the research that was done. So thank you very much for that question. Good question. I'll send you the paper. Uh, I think it was titanium, but I need to, sorry, I need to double check that. Thank you. Thanks. Question from Joanne. Are uh, all uh, gut bacteria equally susceptible for high levels of copper? What makes Good them question. sensitive or resistant? Yes. So. Um, this is a good question and the answer is extremely complex. So if you go back to the, the data I showed you, the clasing data um, with the colorful graph, we just looked at some key pathogenic bacteria. Um, not all um, bacteria are actually that sensitive to copper. Some are, some aren't, but most of them are. This is why uh, copper, for example, is used in this way to manage the microbiota quite nicely because it almost provides like a cap of um, maximum amount of growth possible. Uh, so things like zinc, for example, you need to get a, to a much, much higher level in order to have any sort of antimicrobial effect. So the thing that makes them sensitive or not sensitive, I suppose, is, is a, again, a, quite a complex answer to a question. Uh, but it's like um, every single bacteria has a different uh, optimal growth um, uh, conditions. So some bacteria have a much lower tolerance for bacteria in their environment um, and, and some will, uh, uh, will utilise copper and some will store copper and then will have a toxic effect and apoptosis. So essentially it's a very sort of complex answer. Every bacteria is slightly different, uh, but the most researched ones unsurprisingly are more of the um, more uh, pathogenic bacteria. Interestingly, we do have some work looking at probiotics and we see that certain good bacteria is less affected by copper, which is again another reason why I think that um, we see these positive impacts on performance as well, because we're not necessarily having a, a destructive effect on the gut bacteria like we do with a um, with a, a antimicrobial. We're actually um, uh, with antibiotic, we're actually just uh, preventing that overgrowth that can happen in uh, in a gut health challenging situation. Hopefully that helps you, Juan. Okay, thanks. Uh, Randy's asking a question with the multiple trial analysis. Can you explain why there is no significant improvement in FCR while uh, weight gain has been improved? Mm, mm. I think that's because the uh, feed intake also was improved as well. So um, we we also interestingly see um, the uh, uh, because of the, when you feed high levels of copper sulfate, it actually can have a negative impact on feed intake. So um, with with grow finisher pigs, it's largely understood that that really taste has not much effect um, on them. Uh, they're quite hardy, they eat almost anything, <laughs> as we all know. Um, but with regards to the uh, high levels of inorganic trace minerals, um, actually um, we see um, a negative impact on feed intake, whereas with a, uh, a less soluble source like hydroxy in the feed, we don't have that negative impact. Uh, so therefore the uh, feed intake often can be promoted as well in that and other other work we've done uh, but I think the reason why the gain to feed wasn't significant was because the feed intake uh, was was very similar um, but we saw more growth at the end so that's why we took into account in the uh, 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 return on investment numbers the the feed intake increases perfect well there are still questions uh, coming in so uh, perfect um, Joanne, another question. Any evidence on decreased disease uh, due to gut uh, pathogens when using IntelliBond at uh, 150 ppm? 
Um, so we have some work looking at uh, the immune system. So we're actually releasing a um, we're actually releasing some uh, an article on this work very soon in, in the in the media. Um, essentially, we did some work looking at immune function. So we measured a number of different uh, uh, immune factors, TNF alpha and interleukin one, and and also looked at rectal temperatures. Um, and we applied a, a lipid polysaccharide challenge. Uh, and what we saw was um, very, uh, an improvement in health status uh, overall. And this is um, uh, reflected by a, uh, a, a, a metabolic uh, presence of uh, more of these, uh, sorry, less of these uh, immune factors as well, which is indicating the bit that animals have lower levels of disease challenge. So by measuring these immune factors, we're measuring the level of disease and we saw less. So yes, we have some work looking at that and I can uh, send some work over to you, but we are also uh, releasing it soon in the media. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, Jacqueline, then a question about environment. Uh, what about the environmental impact of extra copper? Will this be excreted or <laughs> and therefore have an influence on the manure quality? Uh, and is this positive or negative? Well, um, good question. Um, so I, uh, before working in, in Cluster Asia, I was working in the UK, uh, where we have extremely uh, uh, low uh, maximum permitted limits of copper. So I, I'm aware that um, it's not actually uh, permitted everywhere to feed these high levels of trace mineral for that reason. Um, yes, the uh, excess copper that has had the antimicrobial effect is being excreted. Um, however, if we look at what's happening now, so the inorganic trace minerals that are being fed uh, are significantly less bioavailable than hydroxy or an organic trace mineral. So if you compare going from feeding a high level of inorganic to a high level of hydroxy, you're gonna have a lot, lot less excretion of these trace minerals in the feces. And we have work to show that, so like we can send that on. So um, if you're currently feeding inorganics and then you feed hydroxy or organic, your excretion will go down. So in fact, it's better for the environment. But obviously, if you're in a market where you cannot feed those high levels, um, using nutritional levels compared to high levels of hydroxy, yes, we will have more excretion. Um, I think with regards to is it good for the environment, I think it very much depends on, well, very much depends on the um, market that you're in and the soil quality and the land and, and the stocking densities. I think a large state reason why the legislation has been put in place in places like the EU is also because of uh, land density. Um, and it's an, an effluent as well. Uh, so I think every market's different and they have different um, issues and needs. Uh, so the answer will depend very much where, on where you are and how the government uh, stance is on limiting these environmental uh, excretions. But if you compare inorganic to hydroxy, we are actually better for the environment because we excrete less because the bioavailability is, of hydroxys is better, and therefore will more will be absorbed into the animal. So less will be excreted in the feces. All right, looking at time, we're going to do one last uh, one. Um, for the, the questions that we didn't answer, we'll make sure that we come back to them uh, after this uh, webinar via email. Uh, so Amporn uh, ask a question about Hi, what is the <laughs> what are the <laughs> oh, my screen? What are the period and pigs that have the most benefits of using uh, TBCC and how long of usage? So what we suggest is using all the way through the growth cycle, um, but where you see where you see the best effects are in the final phases. So you may not see anything for the first phase, and actually that's that's work we're currently embarking on Amporn um, to understand, okay, if you if we utilize in these individual periods, do we see uh, still see those benefits on growth? I actually think you won't because I think it's got more to do with the uh, upregulation of lipid 
uh, metabolism uh, than we realize. And as we know, with pigs, lipid deposition increases, um, which so it makes sense that that's being um, manipulated. So I think based on the validation work we've done and the work that we have, feeding all the way through the finisher cycle um, will get you the best growth benefit based on all of this research we've done. Um, but I think something we haven't yet done is split it up into phases. Uh, but I think based on the mode of action we have, I don't think that splitting those, uh, the feeding up into phases will necessarily have the same effect. Okay, well, thank you all for listening. Thank you, Alice, for your great story. Uh, I hope this uh, gives you more insights in uh, how copper can help uh, in your grow finisher production. Um, if you have questions, uh, feel free to address them to uh, Alice or uh, to me. Uh, the email address that you can use will be uh, available in the emails that you send. We will make sure that the questions that are still coming in uh, are being answered uh, in the coming days. If you want the recordings or the handouts, please uh, send an email as well. We will make sure that we provide it. Um, one last thing to mention is, is that uh, this is the fourth one in a series that we do. Uh, we have uh, three more to come, November the 5th, uh, December the 3rd, and January the 14th. And we have some previous sessions uh, as well. So if you are interested in, in those recordings, then uh, please reach out to us as well so we can send them to you. Um, so thank you all so much for tuning in. Thanks for listening. Hoping to see you in one of the next uh, series as well. And again, Alice, thank you for your story. My pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Have a nice day.